From 2021 to January of this year, Jigger Shaw was director of the U.S. Department of uh, Energy's Loan Programs Office. A pioneer in green finance, Shaw previously built Sun Edison, co-founded Generate Capital, and ran the Carbon War Room. At the Department of Energy, he framed federal lending as a tool of U.S. industrial policy, such as reshoring supply chains, creating jobs, and boosting U.S. competitiveness in the global clean energy race. I've argued for a long time that the Biden administration's approach to this was the, a good one and it, it serves can serve as a model for Canada. So I'm very pleased to welcome Jigger Shaw to the interview. Jigger, happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. This is a profound, this is a conversation that Canada has, needs to have. And I would like to get your take on how the conversation started in 2021 after the Biden administration came in, you know, in January. And how did that all unfold? Well, look, I think that it's very clear that the United States and other Western governments around the world have been extraordinary at research and development, right? Whether it's the invention of the LFP battery by John Goodenough over at UT Austin, or whether it's the invention of the solar panel or modern wind turbines or or other you know technologies, or even electric vehicles with you know Tesla's you know uh, unequivocal leadership there. Um, and what we did over time was really just hand all of those technologies over to Asia and said, you guys like to have the pollution and you like to have all of the low cost labor and you like to do all of these things and you do the scale up and you lose money on the scale up and we'll just import these products back into our country and we'll deploy it. It was very obvious that that model, which we started in the 1990s and into the knots, um, did not have political support, right? People were saying, look, if we're going to import these technologies that we invented back into our country, we'd rather, you know, burn oil and gas, right? And so so it, it was very clear that we needed to embark upon an effort to start to commercialize our technologies here in the United States of America, right? And that was a di in direct conflict with 40 years of agreement around you know, really pushing all of our manufacturing over to Asia and not really doing a lot of manufacturing here. I mean, in some ways, NAFTA was also pushing, you know, manufacturing into Canada or Mexico outside the United States, right? And so I think that this started from something that was deeply political in terms of figuring out like how the American people were feeling about these technologies. And then it got into, okay, if we're gonna figure out how America does big things again, what tools do we need to be able to do big things, right? How do we attract capital into the United States of America? And there were supply side um, activities, which is sort of where the loan programs office sits, as well as some production tax credits and things like that. And then there were demand side activities, right? So this is, you know, forcing battery manufacturers who wanted the EV tax credits for their ultimate product to uh, have local content requirements, right? So otherwise um, they couldn't get access to the tax credit, right? And you saw that with critical minerals processing, you saw that with uh, battery separator manufacturing and all sorts of things, right? Um, and so, you know, so I think that the goal of the Biden administration was to come up with a theory of the case that competed with what China was doing um, to make sure that we actually could, um, you know, keep the enthusiasm um, and the momentum for what we viewed as an inevitable trend, right? The decarbonization of our energy grid is happening because the technologies are purely superior and the costs keep coming down, right? And so now how do we actually figure out a way to, to bring the people along? Um, in uh, 2023, I read a speech by Gina Raimondo, who is the U.S. Uh, uh, Commerce Secretary. And she talked about how in the early year, you know, in 2020, that the United States understood how vulnerable they were to China's supply chains. And that something, there, there needed to be manufacturing reshored so that the clean energy technologies could be manufactured in the U.S. or allies like Canada. And so they would reduce... Uh, uh, vulnerability to China is were other factors like that, you know, the reshoring of manufacturing, national energy, national security. Uh, what role did that play in the conversation? 
Yeah, no, I think it's a really important conversation. I think her comments were more about COVID and the fact that like, you know, all of us felt very vulnerable to the long supply chains that we had gotten used to um, and all this just in time delivery. And, uh, and, you know, when those supply chains got disrupted, you know, you ran out of toilet paper, right? And so, um, you know, figuring out how we actually make all of those supply chains robust uh, really mattered. I think on the national security front, it was very obvious to all of us that that this uh, this trend of solar and battery storage and electric vehicles and wind power being um, manufactured goods, which were continuing to go down in cost with the learning curve, um, were going to be the dominant way that we added electricity um, and transportation on the margins to you know to our societies and to our economies and that that we now needed to manage that supply chain right so when you think about um, OPEC and you know how we managed OPEC in the 1970s um, we didn't want any one country to have so much power that they could actually just swing entire oil markets right and um, and we managed that carefully right with our partnership with Saudi Arabia etc cetera, etc cetera. now the good thing about this technology class is that that those underlying dynamics are different Right. So it's not possible for China to dominate this supply chain forever at the time at which we decide we no longer are going to get access to equipment from China. It takes us four years to process it here. So it's not like there's any lack of rare earth minerals or lack of critical minerals processing or lack of other things. Right. We just choose to let China lose money doing it. Right. But like but in general, if they cut us off from that supply, this is a four year challenge. We know how to manufacture solar panels. We know how to process critical minerals. We know how to do all this stuff. We just choose not to because they're willing to lose money doing it, right? And so now the question really becomes, so we're not in the same situation as oil where, you know, some countries have it, some countries don't. In this case, every country could have the manufacturing capacity to do these things. They just might not be cost effective at doing it. But I mean, solar panels at 30 cents a watt versus solar panels at nine cents a watt, are still the most cost effective way of deploying solar panels. I mean, electricity, right? So, so in general, I think that the way in which we think about managing these risks had never really been thought through. And so the, the US administration had said, let's figure out how we diversify these supply chains. So it's not anti-China, it's more pro-clean energy. You're like, well, if this is gonna be the trend of the future, well then let's figure out how India gets involved in this and Mexico gets involved in this and Turkey and Jordan and Ethiopia. And yes, the domestic market here in the United States.